I asked Kevin backstage, I want to do this poll. He said he wants to be on stage for this poll. Um, who here is a Disney Plus subscriber? Show of hands. Mm. Maybe easier. Is anyone not a Disney Plus subscriber? Well, mm. that's good for you. That's, <laughs> that's your TAM, right? Is that what you guys call it? TAM, yes. Yeah, that's our Guthrie Market right you there. Thought. Um, you, you, you undercut my interview by announcing your news last week. 10 million, what do we call them, subscribers? Sign-ups. Sign-ups, people yes. who have signed up to watch. Correct. Paying something, something from zero to more than zero. We have a few tranches. We had people that signed up in, well in advance to our multi-year offers. Those do not have a free trial period, so they, were, um, they would have been yeah. paying immediately. Uh, all the way through to people that signed up uh, starting on the 12th and thereafter who were, um, uh, they have a free trial period, a seven day free trial period. So right now they're free trialists and they will become paid subscribers when they uh, convert over to, to paying. Yeah, and, and uh, that's US, you told me Netherlands counts in this total? Netherlands, which Canada. we converted from a free trial, yeah. an extended free trial, which was a technology test into a, a paid uh, service. Mostly US. Mostly US and Canada, uh, yeah, yeah. So the, the reaction from everyone in the media world and investor world and Wall Street was, holy cow, that's a big number. What was the, what was the reaction inside Disney? Uh, holy cow, that's yeah. a big number. That was a, you know, we didn't have explicit numbers that we expected to either get or not get. We, we have you know, annual plans and we have long-term plans, but we were very surprised by uh, the size, the magnitude of demand, for sure, of the immediate demand. That was 2X, 3X? Larger than we thought. A lot larger. By a lot. What do you, what do you attribute that, that, uh, that number to, since it was so much more than you were expecting? Well, a lot of things. I think that um, the power of our brands, you know, we know how powerful Disney and Marvel and Pixar and Star Wars and National Geographic, those are all very big, powerful brands. And we know that they appeal to a large number of people. But we did, um, and the content within it is also high quality, and people know what it is. And we had a relatively complete library, not entirely complete, but a lot of our programming, and we made that known. And we had a couple high-profile originals, uh, The Mandalorian, yep. High School Musical, Lady and the Tramp. There were some nice or originals. Forky asks a question. Forky asks a question is my kid's great. favorite. It's can really you, funny. Can you do the voice? No, I cannot do the I voice. I can do it. Forky asks a question. <laughs> my kids walk around the house saying that all day long now, so thank you. Oh, that's, sorry about that. I apologize. That's great. Um, I love it. That is, that's very popular, too. So, um, and we, we used a lot of, we marketed it well, and we're pretty good at marketing. And we uh, used the company's assets, and we call a synergy campaign to make it very uh, well known. And we, I think we achieved our objective of trying to reach 95% of the buying population of the potential TAM, if you will, with at least three messages a month for the three months preceding the launch. And it was effective. I want out. to credit Julia Borston with this insight, which is, uh, she's backstage. She said, uh, if you guys didn't think that number was going to grow significantly and you didn't think you were going to be able to keep most of those customers, you wouldn't be announcing it now because a year from now, I'd say, well, you launched with 10 million, but now you're only at this. What happened? Yeah, Julia's really smart. That's, yeah, yep. <laughs> I agree. And you've already told me and everyone else you're only going to do quarterly updates from now. Yeah, from now on we will, we will announce during our earnings calls. Like Netflix does. Uh, yeah. So you've been watching for years your frenemy at Netflix get rewarded and then sometimes punished for putting out subscriber numbers, kind of only gauged on subscriber numbers. And you, and many people in media say, man, I'd like to be just just judged on subscriber numbers, but instead I have to do profits, um, dividends, all sorts of boring Wall Street terms like that. Yeah. Um, are you guys in a world now where, where you can put out subscriber numbers and, and that's your story? Well, it's our story likely for our direct-to-consumer businesses yeah. for a while. I mean, even direct-to-consumer services are expected to make a profit ultimately, and we gave guidance at our investor day in April that we would be breaking even on Disney Plus in our fiscal year 24. So we're going to make money. We're focused on that. But I do think the metric that is the coin of the realm these days is subscribers for that part of our business. We still have the traditional Disney businesses, the theme parks, the movie yep. you know, studio, all the television businesses that are going to be judged the way they always have been. I asked John Stanky this yesterday. I'll ask you. Um, what point do we gauge sort of the overall competition? There's a year where, the first year all you guys are launching, many people aren't paying for this, they're sampling it for free in some way. When's a reasonable time for the people in this audience, for Wall Street, et cetera, to go, all right, there's this many players, here's how they're really doing. Is this two years out, four years out? You know, some number of years. We gave a five-year guidance because we thought that was long enough to things. For your subs and, pro and yeah. profits. For our subs and profits. Yeah. I think that's... A time frame, that's our investment horizon, I think, and I think we will see the industry shake out a bit by then. 
not everyone's going to succeed. It, there's not, this is not a zero-sum game by any means. The pie is big, and it, and it will be expanding. But not everyone who, who enters is going to end up succeeding. And um, I think the story will be told, you know, I think, will start to be told in the next couple of years. So every time you or anyone else announces a new streaming service and a price point, Many people on Twitter and other smart folks say they add up all the lists of, of different services that you can get online, and then they compare that to a traditional cable bundle, and they go, "This we should be in the cable business. This is ridiculous. Um, do you, th you said it's not a zero-sum game. How many services do you think are going to survive three or four years from now? You know, I don't have a great number. I don't have a crystal ball. I've read reports anywhere from three to five to six even. Um, it depends on how the pricing escalates in the services. It depends on how many people still have a traditional cable bundle or pay otherwise for other yep. entertainment subscriptions. But I think somewhere between three and six seems like a reasonable number. And, and again, some, that's some combination of paid and not paid, right? Like I'm going to be getting Amazon Video whether or not I yeah, want it. Yeah, that counts as a paid, but of course it's just right. add on to something you're already right, paying. Right, because I'm buying but, the free shipping and getting exactly. the video along. The, along. Yeah. In terms of asking customers to make a discrete payment for a video subscription, how many do you think is reasonable to ask of them? You know, I think, again, three to six, maybe five. There'll be some number. People pay, on average, what is it, $80 a, a month for cable subscriptions. Those that de decide to uh, cord cut are freeing up a lot of money, yeah. way more than uh, six to eight uh, SVOD services, I think. Um, and those that don't might opt for senior packages and add on from there. Or people, the real entertainment enthusiasts, might have both and might have several services and a full cable bundle. So unlike some of the other players in streaming, you guys have a very big pay TV subscription business. Yeah. Um, how do you think about balancing that business, which is still big, you still want it to grow, it throws off a lot of cash, versus this thing, which can very much appeal to cord cutters? Yeah. We want to um, deliver the experiences and the business models and the relationships with consumers that they want to have. So I think that the, we, we um, uh, are extremely focused on serving consumers. And if consumers would rather have a smaller, you know, on-demand only set of experiences, we're gonna service that. If they want a linear channel experience, we have that. And the way we've designed our services, look, the, the biggest one would be ESPN Plus. Yeah. ESPN is our biggest earner on the traditional cable and that's, bundle. You have to get through the bundle. I can't get ESPN by itself. ESPN Plus you can get by itself, right. but, we but we very carefully um, delineated the type of live events that will be on ESPN Plus versus ESPN, the main cable networks. The big events, the NFLs, the major college sports, um, baseball, you know, NBA, that's reserved largely for ESPN, for ESPN. The and we talked about this two years ago when you were on yeah. stage, and, you're like, and there was a lot of discussion, should ESPN be split up? Should it, should, it, should it be split up from Disney? Should it be sold a la carte? And you guys consistently said no. Um, and that seems very obvious that you want to and then also sort of have to keep that in the bundle. But I'm sure a lot of people in this room would like to buy ESPN a la carte from you. Look, at some point, Bob's talked about this. At some point, we may very well make the a la carte option available over the top for ESPN. We're not at that point now, and I don't think we're really yeah. very close to that point. People are still well served in the bundle that are sports fans. Um, but we're always monitoring the situation. And again, we want to serve consumers that they, the way they w wish to be served. But there is a real tension, right? Because you there want is. to serve yeah. the customers, but you also need to sort of keep one business intact while creating a new business, which could undermine the old business. It's a classic sort of business school dilemma. It's an innovator's dilemma, to be sure, yeah. and it's classic. But I think that we have shown that we are eager to, in, in the service of consumers, we're willing to you know, put our own businesses at risk to some degree. You have to be judicious about it. We didn't pull ESPN out of the bundle. I think people are still well served by that. But we are introducing services which may very well lead to additional motivations to cut the cord. And we think that's the right thing to do with the, with the services that we put out there. So there's that, that, that adage about if you have feet in both canoes, then eventually you fall over and... I think we'll withdraw a foot from canoes as needed. Yeah. We'll be, and we'll balance ourselves pretty well. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, well, well, it's a point well taken. There's a small version of this that just came out last week, I guess. You guys said you're going to take next day stuff that FX. FX, yeah. Next day, you're going to put it on Hulu. Yes, originals that go on FX, the network will then go on Hulu the next day. Right. We've been doing that on broadcast for a long time with Hulu. Right. Way. And so in one ways, it's old news, but it's still a new thing. If I'm a Comcast or a traditional provider and I say, wait, I'm paying you I'm paying, I'm buying FX from you and then reselling it to the subscriber. You guys just put it on a competitive service, Hulu. What am I doing here? What's the, what's the reaction from the, the MVP? I mean, we haven't had any reaction yet. They're not that I'm aware of yeah. anyway. Um, 
Look, I think they'll find that it's not the thing that they would like most to see in the world. But I think they're also, Comcast, they're smart executives over there, and all the MVPD executives understand the way consumers are dynamically addressing their needs for entertainment, and that servicing consumers is the, is the right thing to do. So I think they'll have a lot of empathy for what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, FX on Hulu, which is a big initiative that we just uh, talked about in our last earnings call, is really kind of a big deal. Um, it's more than kind of a big deal, it is a big deal. And we're going to put the FX brand very prominently on Hulu, and we are going to uh, super serve FX consumers and fans on Hulu. We're going to have not only are we going to do what you said, take original programming that's, that's originating on the linear network and put it on Hulu the next day. The entire library is ultimately going to be on, uh, on mm -hmm. Hulu. And we're making a whole slew of FX on Hulu and uh, originals that will never, that won't premiere on the linear network. And it's going to be a big presence, and it's, I think serve consumers really well. So the same week you announced that, which if I was a regular human being, I wouldn't have noticed because it's a press <laughs> thing, uh, I get an email from Hulu because I am a subscriber to the Hulu Live thing. It says, oh, by the way, we're going from 45 bucks to 55 yeah. bucks in December. They don't even bother to tell me that it's going to be better. It's just going up. Um, <laughs> It's better than $80 still, but... It's better, but it's a, it's, it's a 20% hike. It is. Um, it's sort of prompting me to really do some soul-searching. I don't know, soul-searching. At least some, some accounting about whether I want to pay for a bundle. It seems like you're almost pushing me out of the bundle. No, no. That is not our intention. Look, we have to be in businesses that ultimately turn a profit and are priced reasonably given the prices of the inputs that, they're, that they have. And that, the, the programming we have on the uh, Hulu bundle, is, is the live TV bundle, is quite expensive. It's high quality, it's great. It's a large lineup of sports channels and entertainment channels. And um, for us to reasonably make a profit on that, we had to increase the price. And I think we're not the only ones who have done it. All the yep. digital MVPDs have done it. And some have gone out of business. And I, we're not going out of business. I think we're, we're there to serve our consumers. And that's something we had to do. And I, this was a blog post, I, I, again, because I'm not a normal human, I'm a reporter. I, I, I saw the blog post. It said, uh, by the way, if yeah. this is expensive, we, we yep. hear you. Uh, why don't you think about churning in? They don't use the word churn. But if, why don't you, if, you like, if you're a football fan, pay for us through football season and then turn off the live stuff and then come back later in the year. Um, I don't know that I've seen someone sort of tell customers to leave and come back before. Is that a new thing for you guys? <laughs> it's a first. Yeah. Uh, we felt that if we're raising the price, we want to remind consumers of the flexibility of what we offer. And I think it was the right thing to do. I think, again, in service of consumers, keeping consumers front of mind and their, their, their needs you know, uh, being pre preeminent in their thinking, we wanted to remind them that this was not uh, something they had to pay for. And if they had a seasonality to their needs for the live package, they could always come in and out. I think it's the right thing to do. I, would, I, I do think. And I think it, received, it was received warmly by our uh, Hulu audience. So let's go back to Disney Plus. Um, my kids have watched Forky. We're watching The Mandalorian. That's going to run through December. And I have two kids, so we're going to keep subscribing. Um, I do wonder if I didn't have the kids and I was a Star Wars fan and I'd watched the new show and then I'd watched everything else that's already run, is there stuff for grown-ups to keep watching on Disney Plus? Will you be adding more stuff that's yeah. aimed at grown-ups? We are adding more stuff that's aimed, aimed at, aimed at grown-ups. There's a bit of, uh, it takes, there's a lead time to create really high quality um, original programming. So we have, we have it coming on in a cadence that we think is the right cadence that we can both um, make sure it's high quality. We don't want to rush things through just to have volume. That's not our philosophy. We always want to do fewer things better and notch up our creative execution to the extent we can. That's been our philosophy for since Bob's been CEO, actually. And we did that in the studio, we do that in television yeah. production, we're doing that here. That's important to us to do that. So we're not gonna be flooding the market with a whole bunch of originals, but we do have the pay one movies, the movies that come out of um, theatrical exhibition and then a couple months in, um, in home video. Those will come on the, on the service in a month, almost a monthly cadence. So it's kind of convenient that they do come on in that, in that um, pattern. And we had the best uh, slate of all times in 2019 that's coming onto our service over the next year. It is massively popular movies that will be available uh, exclusively and permanently on Disney Plus when they come out. That's going to be important. We do have more um, originals that are coming out. We, at D23, we announced a whole, I think it was three or four uh, Marvel uh, series that are gonna start um, coming out in several months. Is there an argument where you just go, look, this is for kids. If you, if no, you are a kid, kids. if you have kids, get it. And if you're an adult, you can go watch FX or HBO or whatever. No, look, we bundled it together with Hulu for one, that's one reason yeah. too. We gave a really good price, I think it's, if you add up all the services independently, it was an $18 price, an already aggressively priced, and we took that down $5 because we thought that uh, we could super serve 
uh, all, a whole range of demographics with that suite of programming. But Disney Plus is a four quadrant service. Mandalorian is a adult uh, entry point. It's a family, it's family friendly. Yep. Any kids can watch it, but it's an adult entry point. And we have plenty of programming that's adult entry points from a movie format and from an original series format that we're gonna be putting on the service. And no, it's really not just for kids. I, I wanna be emphatic about that. And then is there stuff that, so you brought over The Simpsons from Fox. Mm -hmm. Is there other Fox content that you're debating bringing in and thinking, I don't know, maybe this fits, maybe this doesn't fit? I mean, look, we've had debates. We, we designed the service, we had a very simple mission and strategy. It's Disney Plus and it's the five brands. It's content under, the, under Disney, Marvel, Pixar, Star Wars, and National Geographic, and that's what the service is. The Simpsons isn't under one of those brands. It was an exception, a high profile exception, a great exception. It's gotten a lot of play on the, on the service. I'm not gonna get into numbers about that, but it's, got, it's done very well. And we're proud to have it on Disney Plus, but we don't wanna make too many exceptions uh, of that five brands as the kind of the navigational and strategy metaphor for the service. So I don't think we're gonna be pulling in a bunch of unbranded uh, or product that doesn't fit under those brands in the future. Might we from time to time make an exception like we did for The Simpsons? Yes, but nothing is currently under consideration. Um, back to pricing and partnerships, and uh, you did this deal with Verizon. I'm one of those subs who didn't pay for it. Um, I think you said there's 17 to 18 million people that are that, that are, qualify that could yeah. qualify for this. Do you run the risk of devaluing the programming by giving it to me for free for a year and then having to come back and ask me for 10 bucks or whatever it is then? Well, if we thought so, we wouldn't do it, and we picked our we picked our uh, partner very very carefully. Like there's other partners, like they could have worked, but Verizon is a really high quality brand. Um, the, we love the management team, team over there, Hans Vesberg, the CEO is great. And his vision for how to deploy this really matched up with ours. It's, it's for his top tier of subscribers, unlimited data, Fios and 5G. It's 17 to 18 million, as you said. Not all of them will sign up. I, that would be shocking if everyone signed up for it. Um, and it's in a high quality environment. And I think that people, his, his customers will appreciate it. Are certainly, uh, the, our customers who are also Verizon customers see a lot of value in it. And I do not think, I think, they, I think it's well understood that it's a special, that it's a, a treat for Verizon for a limited period of time. I do not think it destroys our price value relationship. Do you talk to them about how they are messaging that offer to their customers? I, I, maybe I turned off notifications. I didn't get any email from them when I went to sign up on Tuesday morning. It was like several steps, again, because I'm not a regular, normal human. I did it. <laughs> Um, I'm assuming it's gotten easier, but I mean, do you talk to them about that flow and should this be something where they're trying to bring in new customers with the offer, reward existing customers? I think it's both for them. It's mo that's, most of that is their prerogative, but yes, we have talked at, in detail about yeah. how they're gonna market it. Well, I'm pretty pleased with how they marketed it. I, am, I have heard anecdotes like yours where people didn't get um, messaged the day it came, the day it was available. I thought that there was going to be a, a blanket messaging that happened. Can't speak to your specific yeah. case. Um, but they've been great partners and, and, and they've let us in and we've let them in and we've been partnered on how, on how, we, how we approach the marketplace. Uh, the other launch day question I'm obliged to ask you, you guys had stumbles, you had to acknowledge it publicly. Worked fine for me, I'll stipulate. I'm assuming it worked fine for most people, but it was enough of a problem that you had to say we're having problems. Yeah, it, it was. You guys spent almost $3 billion on BAM tech so you could have good streaming. You tested it out in the Netherlands. You said we found problems in the beta test. What, what went wrong yeah. on Tuesday? Without getting into technical detail, I do want to address that. I'm glad you asked that, actually. Um, we architect, there's a certain architecture in, uh, one, in certain elements of how we deploy the app that we've used in the past and we've been using it for a long time. And we never had, as much as prolific as BAMTech has been, we've never had demand like we saw that day and that we're continuing to see, obviously, and it's clearly growing. So um, some limits to the technology, to the architecture that we had in place were made apparent to us that weren't before. And I want to, I, there's been some rumors that it was that Amazon, it was Amazon's fault or some uh, other third party, it was not. Was, I want to make sure that, I want to say that. This was not Amazon hitting it was a not capacity Amazon, problem. It was not Amazon hitting a capacity problem, it was not a third party hitting a capacity problem. It had to do with the way we architected a piece of the app. Now, it's a coding issue, we're gonna recode it and, and we'll see, no pun intended, but we are gonna recode it and get it, okay. Yeah, good. Um, and, and then we're going to start. We're, we're going to start um, seeing new uh, updates to our client software over the next week and a half, probably. So, so that so it's something you can fix. It's not something that's structural. Someone was speculating that this was had to do with the way you guys wanted to sort of keep your your hands around the content. You didn't want to distribute it. You didn't want to peer. No, no, it's not structural at all. It's literally one of the, one one part of the tech stack that we that we use in a certain way that could we should, we could use another way. So if I, I ask hit you, the limits. if I ask you what lessons you learned, you said fix. You would say we're going to fix the software. That's the lesson. Well, one lesson is. Um, 
try to understand what the demand might be a little better, and that was, we were surprised by that, and I guess maybe you could say we shouldn't have been, but it was, it was quite remarkable what we got. Is it hitting the front door, that problem? Like 10 million people come into the front door and you can't get through the door, or is it serving those 10 million people once they're in? It was serving the 10 million. We got, people got in the door, our e-commerce systems, which we focused on a lot, worked really well. And that front end, we had redundancies built in, we had caching layers that we built. It was really rock solid. People could subscribe for the most part, but we ran into, we ran into the issues with this architecture and, I, and we're fixing it. And you know, some people said you know, the continue streaming um, yeah. feature wasn't working. And it didn't work for a little while, it was a, it was a victim of that architectural issue. We actually have a, a patch around that. Right now it is working. And then the graphics that denote that it's working, the resume playing and a, and a row that says continue watching, all the different things that you've, been, that you've started, all the different programs, that's gonna reappear over the next week. So we have, so those, th those were features of our product that we had to take, we had to take down for a p period of time. So, so you people understand that people that. want to start yes, the course. movie again. And right now, if you do yeah. do it, right now, it does start where you, where you left off. It just doesn't say it is, but it does. It actually has that feature, that capability built into it. So look, we had, we had some issues. We also had some customer service issues, which didn't make me feel good. I, as much as I appreciate the demand How did you had, express your discontent? Um, very, I was very um, measured. And I was very measured, I'm not being tongue in cheek. And, it, and we had, look, the BAM Tech people are real professionals. They've done this before, they've run into these issues before. Um, not this particular issue, but they run into issues, they know how to handle it, and they're very cool headed, and they're very, um, they're, they're great engineers. And they can pick apart a problem, deconstruct it, get to the root cause, and fix it really well. And they're good at that. And so I let them do their job, and that's the right thing to have done. But if you think about our launch, it was more complex. Not only was there huge demand, but the complexity. We serve consumers with these bundles, but they made it complex. We have the, the ESPN, Hulu, Disney bundle. There were a lot of questions that arose from people trying to access that bundle. Who are current subscribers? How will it work? How much will you add on to my bill? A bunch of legitimate questions that we tried to make obvious in our sign-up flow, but not everyone understands that. That's totally, totally under expected. We have the Verizon uh, bundle. You had some issues with it. You were technically savvy enough. You probably self-served and yep. did it yourself. Many people had to call in and, and get customer service help. Um, we also used a database, which is very robust, that we use for all of our, all of our um, uh, accounts throughout the company. It has several hundred million accounts. Many people who signed up forgot they had an account, forgot their password. We had to recommission passwords and have them reauthorize re, re themselves. And there were a whole bunch, that was probably the biggest single source of customer service calls that we had, people forgetting their passwords and forgetting they even had an account with this uh, system that we had for that email address. So all those added up to a little, little more complexity than we would have liked and a lot of demand. And so that was the customer service. We felt bad about that actually. So very broadly in the streaming wars, and some people don't want to call them wars, we can call them conflicts. Uh, you've got tech companies getting into media, and then you've got media companies getting into tech. You're obviously yeah. in the second category. Um, there was some question when you guys bought BAM Tech that maybe you overpaid. Uh, in retrospect, I'm assuming you think you didn't overpay because you have a service that works. Yeah. Um, is there anything that the tech guys know how to do that you guys still haven't figured out or you wish you had their facility, their capacity? Well, I mean, they operate, I mean, Take Netflix, for example. I admire Netflix greatly. You've heard me say that before. And they admire you. Yeah, well, that's a new mutual admiration society, but we both, I think we both earn, earn that respect. They have, they are operating this service at massive scale, way, of course, an order of magnitude bigger than ours. 160 million. 160 million. Um, I think I, I respect that. Having now gone through this launch at that, you know, you know, 10 million that we had in the first day, I see how difficult that is to operate that with the quality levels. They rarely have outages. They have very high quality streaming. Downloads happen really fast. Their compression algorithms are fabulous. And the quality of their video is really good. Now, the quality of our video is really good too. But we're at a different scale right now. We're not multinational like they are yet. We're in a couple countries. We're launched Australia New Zealand uh, yeah. yesterday, our time, Tuesday, uh, Australia time. And, um, and you know, we've, done, we've, we've deployed. But I, I'm, I admire their ability to really to have that rock solid infrastructure in place, and we'll get there. And yeah, I how long do you think you'll, it'll take you to match their, their engineering and tech prowess? Well, I think at a small scale, we, we have, you know, we don't match them. I think they're, they're, they've been doing this a long, long time at, the, at big scale. But, you know, in, in a, in quickly, I think in a couple of years, we'll be, you know, knocking on that sort of So do you think door. that becomes a non-issue, the tech versus media company, you guys are all in the same boat? Well, as you said, it's just we approach from different points, but we end up meeting in the middle. And they have, they, and they do great uh, with content, by the way. I think, but you know, we have, I think, selfishly and maybe non-objectively, I think we have the best content on the planet. And will they get there someday? Quite possibly. I don't know. Uh, maybe they will. Um, 
but they have a ways to go there, and we have a ways to go to get to the technology place, a space where they're at. But I do think we're meeting in the middle, and I think we each will um, end up looking like each other to some degree in the future. Um, I was asking Stanky about this yesterday, and I was not quite sure what, he, what his answer was, so I'll ask you. AT&T owns <laughs> their own distribution. Yeah. They've added media to it. Netflix has 160 million subs. They're a pure media company. They don't own distribution, although they have an app. Um, you guys are working with telcos and cable guys, but you don't own your own distribution. Um, is there any disadvantage to not having a, a dedicated set of pipes, wires, whatever metaphor you want to use? I have to, th my answer would be I don't think so. And this was a big decision. We, we had never been in distribution before, but when we came to see that you could have a high quality distribution business, being at retail in direct privity with your consumers, you know, direct connection, that is distribution in my viewpoint. When you can do that in a high quality way over um, a standardized set of pipes, that's when we decided that it's time for us to get into that business. And I don't think there were any disadvantage because the open internet is configured in such a way that allows players like us to access customers right over that infrastructure. We're abstracted from that infrastructural concern. And I think that is the reason we're doing it. Had we had to own wires, we wouldn't be in that place. And, and we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. But that has been a sea change in how we can access customers. I don't think you need to own satellites. I don't think you need to own pipes. You don't need to own uh, spectrum over the air. You just need to own great content and a great service and an infrastructure that works over that open set of platforms. And, and your and thought is that if, if the customers demand us, then the pipe you get, people are going to deliver us. Yes. We are, any we're not worried about net neutrality. A pipe that decided not to deliver us, despite the customers that wanted us, faces backlash. And I just don't think that's a tenable place to be. OK. I have more questions for you, but I want to tell you guys to line up. I think people are also going to be up there, maybe waving at us. So if I don't see you, shout, too. But here's your chance to ask Kevin questions. Um, one last one. Yeah. Um, Netflix has gone back and forth about how they describe their use of data informing programming choices. Mm -hmm. So you guys launched without the customer data, right? But now you've got 10 million subs, and then you're going to have more. How do you imagine having direct access to the consumer and direct knowledge about what they're viewing and not viewing is going to affect your programming choices? Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's two ways to look at how data might be used. You can use data to inform what programs you want to make, which ones are going to appeal to subscriber sets that, we're, that we want, which ones might increase um, the lifetime value of customers that we have in or reduce churn is the same thing. Data can tell you that. You might not always follow the data. We might have great creative ideas that don't fit right into where the data would point you to make a program. So we're going to use both, our judgment, our, our, the ideas that we have in place, the capacities that we have, have in place, and the data that tells us what to make. Certainly, we're paying attention to that. Once you decide to make a program, I my opinion, I think those at Disney um, largely would be using data to try to guide creative decisions within a program that you've decided to make would be uh, not something we would do. That's so where we, we have found that judgment. people tend to see this kind of scene seven minutes. That we wouldn't do. That's not. A, that's what if, not what if customers do. actually like that, and that makes a better show? If it likes it, if the customers like it, we will get the feedback implicitly, and our creators will, you know, make programs that, that you know, that reflect that. But we make programs that are super popular. And so I think we have a good finger on the pulse of what consumers like and or actually love in content. Or to put it another way, what if that it. could help you avoid a miss? I don't think it does. I just, my, my gut is, and I could be wrong, that the overuse of data and trying to make, get to that sort of resolution to make minute by minute creative choices is just a, is a, is a fallacy. I just don't think data actually gives you that insight. I think that's a creative process. And creative processes are fundamentally don't yield, they fundamentally don't yield to that sort of analytical look. Creative you're an, process. You're an analytical guy. I am, but I, re, I respect the creative process, which is much different. Great. I've got a lot of questions. Uh, I'm, I've got two quick Introduce ones. yourself, Julia. <laughs> uh, Julia Alexander, Verge. Two quick questions. Um, on the Hulu Live TV bundle front, there was a message in the blog that said Hulu is actively exploring ways to provide additional, more tailored live TV options in the future. And I was wondering if you could explain what that looks like. Is that a skinnier bundle for people who are subscribing to it? It could be. We actually haven't made any decisions. We're, we're just now starting that exploration. Um, we have certain obligations to our um, channel partners that we'll have to work through, actually, if we we're going to do that. But I think it's, it's, it's along the spectrum and the continuum of trying to serve our consumers the way they want to be served. And we've recreated not as large a bundle has been out there, but a pretty large bundle still. And it's like one size fits all. And I think over time, we're going to find that one size does not fit all. And we'll want to make some, uh, some changes. 
But we had, I don't have any answers for you right awesome. now. On that. And on the Disney Plus front, um, the first thing I saw on Twitter when it went live was people internationally trying to get VPN changes and piracy <laughs> issues, obviously. So my questions are, with Mandalorian now and then Falcon and the Winter Soldier coming yeah. out, people are going to download this legally. How are you guys thinking about that? Well, there's so, there's, that's part of doing business, and you can't prevent piracy entirely. We have a great anti-piracy team, both at our studio and with the MPAA, that looks after that on a global basis. We're taking the steps that we can take. Um, we all we're, we're, we understand that there's no way to prevent that sort of activity. The best way, I've always thought, in this space, the best defense is a good offense. And if you can offer consumers, or not, that's why it's incumbent upon us to launch quickly, as quickly as we can in markets. If you offer consumers a high quality uh, experience at a fair price with well-timed availability of content, most people will assume will pay you for it because that was the argument years ago from the pirates. Like, well, I I I would steal it if if you could give it to me, and now they'll steal it anyway. But some of them will, yeah. But I think the majority will not, and I think that's the best way to avoid piracy is to offer a great product. Dave, hi, uh, Dave Morgan from Simul Media. Kevin, how do you um how do you approach competing with companies that have some pretty powerful subsidies behind their products? I mean. Many would argue that streaming video is a free toaster for you know an e-commerce sign-up um, or a piece of hardware, and and you know retail is an industry significantly bigger than video entertainment. Um, you know, does that you f feel daunted by that? No, no, I do not feel daunted. I think it's it's our primary business. It's the focus of everything we do at the Walt Disney Company, and to some companies it might be an adjunct thing to maybe give subscribers who get free shipping a little bit extra. And I think that our degree of focus, not, I'm not casting aspersions on anyone, but that is our entire business, it's our entire DNA, it's our ethos. To making great content is hard. It is really difficult. As I said, I don't think it yields to an analysis. It just is, you need great creators and great concepts and, and courage and boldness. So we can do that. And, and if you want our content, you gotta come to Disney Plus. It's not available elsewhere. And I think we have content that people want. People sometimes miss that. It's not like the music business. Music services have basically the same yep. offering in each music service. You can decide, oh, this is cheaper, or it's a throw in with an Apple device, or whatever it might be. We don't have that. If you want our content, you have to subscribe to Disney+. Plus. There's no alternative to it. And I don't think that's a replacement. You can't replace it with that which is available on other services. It's not a replacement. So I think we also benefit from that. Thanks. Marvel movies are not fungible. They're not fungible. Yeah. Like, well said. Uh, Lucas Shaw with Bloomberg. Uh, like Julia, two questions that are related though. So given that you've modeled 2024 as the year that Disney Plus breaks even, I'm wondering in those models, what do you forecast being the state of pay TV then? How many people are gonna be still paying for a bundle? And though you now delineate between ESPN and ESPN Plus, we assume that those numbers for pay TV will keep going down. At what point do you think we start to see major sports, big NBA matches, yeah. NFL matches on ESPN Plus? That's a good question. Uh, hard to answer it precisely. I don't have an answer for what we think the, uh, the 24 um, numbers will be. And that's a forward-looking, I, I can't really um, divulge that. And, and I don't have a crystal ball. So whatever I told you, if I were able to tell you, it would almost un undoubtedly be incorrect. I talked to someone at the NFL who has a very NFL-specific version of that. Uh, yeah, well, can you say what it is? No. Okay. They, they would like to know when the <laughs> NFL is going to make it to Disney Plus. Disney Plus or ESPN Plus? Or ESPN Plus, yeah. right, thank you. Well, uh, there will be a time, I do, and I do think it's a, it's a trade-off. When, when the pay TV uh, numbers uh, are low enough, and all you have is sports fans that are, in, that are in that bundle, does it make sense at that point, rather than wholesaling to a, what's basically a sports fan-only bundle, to be a retailer and enjoy the retail economics of that? And I think that's something we keep thinking about. I'm not sure what a precise crossover point would be, but there, that is the type of thing that we think about a lot uh, at Disney and, and so it's a good question, and uh, and you know we're trying to answer it for ourselves, actually. Thanks. Thanks. Someone's told me to take one last question, but we're going to go a few more because we only get Kevin on stage a few times. Uh, Tom. Sure. Hey, Kevin. Tom. Did Tom I? with the information. Yeah. Um, two questions for you. One, um, could you give a sense of how demand looked, uh, you know, sign up wise for Disney Plus in the weekend following the launch? Obviously, you guys had a big first day. Um, got you know big signups just for that because it caused some architectural issues. Um, but uh, is there a sense of you know what it looked like in the days following, uh, especially? Look, the um, I wish I could answer that you know directly. Mm -hmm. uh, I I can't. Um, it's um, I just can't answer that. I'm sorry. But, okay. Uh, you know we're not we're not displeased by how it's been going. Okay. And then uh, quickly a second question. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine you would be. Um, uh, second question is uh, Hulu and its international push. Um, could you give a sense of what that priority is? 
for, for Disney when we might get. Yeah, uh, I just uh, had a meeting Hulu. today uh, before this on our Hulu International deployment. It's a complicated, uh, it's a complicated um, set of uh, trade-offs that we have to consider in making that. It's going to be a more investment, um, and it's going to be a big lift, taking Hulu in a general entertainment space where preferences run more local than, you know, than in this Disney space that we're in, or our, our product works globally really well. It's a different, it's a different ball game, and Hulu, the brand, isn't as well known outside the U.S. as Disney and our other five brands are, which are global brands. So it's a different calculus, and it's something that is taking um, taking some time. And um, I think in the not too distant future, we're going to have some something to say about it. But right now, we don't. Okay, thank you. Yeah, two more. Uh, Rob from Fox TV, not a reporter though. Um, going back to the entertainment piece or the uh, technology piece. You said Bamtex a few years behind Netflix, but there's this whole other company, Hulu, that you have that's probably closer yeah. technology-wise to Netflix. Um, is you, are there plans to do sort of a knowledge share? How are you going to approach yeah. melding those two? Yeah, that's a really, it's an excellent point. Um, Bamtech's been in the business for 10 years, 12 years, however long it's been for streaming. And Hulu has a, a much bigger scale um, than Bamtech. And of course, you could see that there are elements of each that might be best in class, as these best in class that we own. Um, so we are going to harmonize um, our platform approach at some point and take the best of each and try to service all of our, all of our services with a, the most robust technology platform that we can possibly assemble. We're going to do it. There's nothing to announce about it. It's just a process we have to go through. And by the way, we have great elements of technology at Hulu. We have great elements of technology at Bamtech. We have great elements of technology even overseas. That, um, our biggest direct consumer service is Hotstar. Um, that we serve over 300 million monthly active users on a, during the cricket season there. So um, we have technology pockets everywhere, and harmonization of that is a, a long process, and it never ends, actually. This is going to be a continuous process of trying to get the very best solution we can in each part of the technology apparatus that we, that we own. So yes, we are, going, we are doing that. Thanks. Hi, Kevin. Alex Krugloff. Uh, since Walt Disney was alive, and for quite a while, actually, when he was still alive, Disney has been in the experiences business, cruises and, of course, theme mm -hmm. parks. But when it comes to video, when it comes to anything digital, hasn't really taken any meaningful swing uh, into the interactivity or experiences business. Um, as you think about, uh, if you look at it now, uh, Disney Plus differentiates itself based on content, but not really based on what is available from a consumption type uh, standpoint. Is this something that you foresee happening uh, in the coming few years, the idea of going into businesses like, like gaming. Like gaming, and we've been in, we've made forays into gaming from time to time. Um, none of them have been that successful, frankly, not on the scale that we're used to achieving. And we like to do needle-moving things, and we like to stay true to what we're great at. I mean, Disney's, you know, great at video storytelling, theme parks, um, assembling great channels together, and 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 aggregating great content under and under fantastic brands. That's where we're best at. We still have runway there, I think, to grow. I think this Disney Plus launch has shown that. Um, and we have a global rollout coming uh, with that in Hulu. Um, I think there's, we have a lot of growth ahead of us sticking to our knitting. So I think that's what you'll see us do. So you're not going to launch a Fortnite? A what? You're, gonna launch, no. you're not going to launch a Fortnite? I mean, you're not going to do interactive video consumption? We have a few games that we do yeah. launch from time to time. Mostly we've converted that publishing business to licensing, because I think that's, that's been working out better for us. And we had never cracked the code on gaming and to the same uh, magnitude that we've been successful in our other businesses. So as of now, I'm not aware of it. I'm not, no longer a corporate, a chief strategy officer, but I'm not aware of any um, new initiatives in the gaming space that we're going to be. Thanks, Alex. That's a good segue from my, my last question. I saved it for myself. Um, the last time you were here, you were chief strategy officer. Yeah. You were a biz dev M&A guy. You are a contender to be CEO of this company at some point. This is the first time you've operated stuff within Disney. Um, what have you learned? What didn't you know about operating a company with Disney that you've learned since then? Operating is a lot different than, than a strategy role and a business uh, development role. Um, you have a lot of personnel issues that you deal with a lot. Organizational design, There's especially in our business where we're introducing a bunch of new businesses and the complexity that I deal with because I have international operations that report to me also and ad sales and content sales and channel sales around the world and domestically that are part of my organization. So the organizational challenge of making sense of a very broad array of assets has been and that's an operating uh, challenge. That's been that's been uh, interesting. I love it. It's yeah. been. I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. Um, and there's, you deal a lot with very senior um, operating executives, and you have to um, learn how 
to um, deal with people in that way. And it's a, it's a different environment. And I'm, I've learned, I've had a crash course in dealing with um, my team that way. And I think I've, uh, it's, it's good. It's a nice growth opportunity. You don't usually get to have nice growth opportunities uh, no, you, <laughs> in middle middle. It's nice, age. right? Yeah. I, I've really enjoyed it. I've really good. enjoyed it. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad you came by. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin.